All right, can you hear me? Oh, awesome. So today I'm going to be talking about how to get computers to understand or really process us. And my name is Preeti Kasreddy, and a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I blog a lot. I, uh, I also teach a bunch. Um, I was previously a co-founder at Sapien.ai uh, and an engineer at Coinbase. And then I was, before that, in my previous life, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. And I also worked at Goldman Sachs. So if anyone in here by any chance knows me, it's probably because you read some article that I wrote about why I'm leaving the best job in the world to be an engineer. Um, and that's why I'm here today, because I love engineering and I want to talk more about it. So some of the things I love uh, that I nerd out about are artificial intelligence, natural language processing, uh, conversational UI, UX. I'm obsessed with JavaScript and the web, and functional programming. So the goals for today, uh, I want to talk about, first start off with talking about the evolution of how we as humans interacted with computers, then get into how today we're, tra we're training computers to understand us. Um, and we use natural language processing and machine learning to do this. And I'll also walk through some of the challenges we see in that, and as well as my predictions and conclusions uh, for the future. So the evolution of human-computer interaction. Back in 1832, when, we're, when we created punch cards, were the first time we had the ability to store and retrieve data and interact with the computer using punch cards. So really, this is how we interacted with a machine. It would have a bunch of holes. They represent some kind of letter or a number. And there would be 80 columns in width. And that's what we'd use. And so when you're programming, re, uh, basically, if you're trying to refactor code, it'd be a matter of reordering these punch cards. Then we moved on to the QWERTY keyboard. And this came in 1972. And the reason it's uh, called that is because the first five letters are Q-W-E-R-T-Y, very similar to keyboards we have today. Um, and this really made a huge difference in how we interact with computers. Then in the 19, 1941, we came out with the first fully programmable uh, automatic digital computer. And this is, this is, the, uh, this is an example of a Z3. Uh, it was actually originally created in Berlin to perform statistical analysis on like wing flutter, but eventually got used for computers. And the way we would interact with these is it'd have a tiny terminal, and then the input was a special keyboard, and then the output was like a row of lamps that showed you the output. So very, very different from how we interact with computers today. Then just a few years later, we had a much more general purpose computer. This was this massive machine, you know, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors. There was a rumor that whenever you turned this computer on, um, the lights in Philadelphia would dim, because that's how much power it took. And so the way we'd interact with, it, with this was it would have an IBM card reader um, and an IBM card puncher as an output. Then a few years later, we moved to punch tapes. This is a huge advance from punch cards. Instead of lining up a bunch, bunch of punch cards to store and retrieve information, we moved to a long piece of tape where we would store um, and retrieve information. Then the era of mainframe computers. These are these gi gigantic commercial computers. They usually have other computers attached to it. There was really no explicit interface when they, early, when they first got invented. So you would typically, they would accept like punch cards or paper tape or magnetic tape. But um, this is kind of how you interacted with computers. Then came the trackball. So this, is what, this, was, the really, this was really the precursor to the mouse. This, this was invented in 1952 for DATAR, which is a system for, um, for the Navy. And it was then moved and used for computers as well. And then a few years later, we invented a joystick, which originally was used, again, for the Navy for aircraft and controlling aircraft. And then eventually, a company called Craft Systems became an OEM manufacturer to use these for computers and controlling computers as well. And then a few years later, we came to the portable personal computer. And this was a 50-pound giant thing that, you that was personal computing. And it costs anywhere between 11,000 and 20,000. And you can see the early innings of a real personal computer. Then in the late 70s came the window-based GUI. And really, Xerox Park was the first one to come out with this. And they came out with the Xerox Alto and the Xerox Star. 
Um, and they were really the first ones to create the mouse-driven GUI system that we're so used to today. And then Steve Jobs was super ins inspired by Zero Parks. And so he really wanted to take this idea and commercialize it. So he was the one with the Apple Lisa kind of really mainstream the, the mouse and the window-based GUI. Then fast forward to 1996, and you have the first Palm Pilots. These are finally mobile. You can carry them around anywhere you want. They have all your personal information in it. And these are pretty, pretty slick. They had a little pen that you can write with. Um, and then 10 years later, you come out with the touch and camera-based mobile computing. And this is what we're so used to today. This is what we use have our, in our pockets every day and every second. And, um, but what's next is conversation. Uh, as you're seeing, we're starting to interact with computers by simply talking to them, whether that's a Google Home or Echo or your Siri or a Bixby or your Google um, Assistant, whatever it is. And really, the reason is it's because a lot, it's a lot easier and faster. Think about uh, on a phone, we have, which have dinky little keyboards. We've gotten used to it, but voice is just so much easier. And so it's become important as for scientists and us to figure out how to teach these computers to actually understand us. And taking a step back, so why would, what are the actual applications of having a computer understand us, right? Well, if a computer can understand us, we can teach it to do translation, for example. Or we can teach it how to take a long piece of natural language text and summarize it into short bullets. Another use case is you can start to do sentiment analysis. So if you have some long piece of text, you can start to get sentiment out of, out of it, whether it's negative, positive, neutral, so forth. Then you can go to even more advanced use cases where you can train it on large bodies of, of information and answer questions, like the IBM Watson computer. Another use case, you're probably pretty familiar with this already, is information extraction. So if you have a piece of text and the computer can understand certain pieces of it, then it can extract information from it. In this example, in Gmail, you already have, if you put a time, you can already add a, a calendar event, and that's because it's able to extract information from that natural language. And my favorite is because voice-driven assistance. So you have some task, like let's say you have to mail something, so you tell your, or you ask your phone, how, where's the nearest post office? It understands it, and then it converts it to speech, and it shows you the result. And the, this becomes very useful for like daily tasks, like making appointments, finding directions, and buying things, and so forth. But the problem is, teaching computers how to understand us is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, the reason is because it's this idea of cursive dimensionality. In other words, the number of different ways a human might phrase even a simple question is really infinite. And our human brains are really, really good at understanding these millions of language variations in a fraction of a second. But these computers, teaching a computer how to do that in a fraction of a second is really, really, really hard. So I kind of want to talk about how some of the ways that we are using technology today to teach computers how to understand us. Sorry, I went too fast. Okay, um, so understanding, so <laughs> I'm gonna start off by talking about NLP and machine learning, which are two technologies that we use to teach computers to understand us. NLP is natural language processing, and it can start from either speech or text. And if you're starting with speech, you typically wanna do something called phonetic analysis. And I'll explain what these are in next slides. And if you're starting with text, you wanna do something called tokenization. Then you want to do something called morphological analysis and syntactic analysis and semantic analysis. This is where you start to get meaning. And then finally, discourse analysis. So starting with phonetic analysis, what does that mean? So let's say you have a piece of, uh, someone says something. Uh, phonetics is just a study of physical, uh, study of human language, right? So you break a continuous stream of sound into words, and then you break those words into appropriate phones and letters. Uh, the challenge with this, obviously, is you have to really, really get the phonetical patterns, phon phonological patterns right. So, for example, I'm enormously proud, and I mean to make you proud. I'm, I mean, are very similar, and being able to extract that is obviously a very difficult problem. 
But with some of the latest uh, and greatest speech recognition technologies today, we've come a very long way in how we can do this and how accurately we can do this. Next part is tokenization. So if you're starting from a piece of text, let's say my piece of text is, what's up, Vienna? Let's teach computers to understand us. Then you want to tokenize it in, by chopping it up into pieces or, call, or tokens so that you can start to do analysis on each of these tokens. Then morphological analysis. Morph morphology is simply the study of word formation. So it's the structure of words and parts of words. So things we, the type of things we do here are things like stemming. So we might strip the words of their suffixes. That way we can get to the root of the word, um, which is called lemmatization. So some examples. So let's say you have ducks. Uh, the root word is obviously duck plus an S. So that's duck, which is a noun plus a plural. Um, same with merging. Uh, that's merge plus ing. So we split merge, which is a verb, plus present participle, which is ing. And this is, this is what we consider morphological analysis. And it also includes things like intonation and stress. Next part, after all this, is we want to do syntactic analysis. So syntactic analysis means how words are grouped and connected to each other in a sentence. So this includes things like parts of speech tags, or finding dependencies between dip different parts of words, finding named entities or determining noun chunks in a sentence. And I'll go through each one of these. That's why I'm going through these fast um, in the next slide. So to start with, one way of doing syntactic analysis is finding the part of speech tag. So going back to the same sentence, what's up, Vienna? Let's teach computers to understand us. We first broke it up into tokens. Now we can start to tag them on their parts of speech. And this starts to give us information about this text. Then we want to, once we have the tokens and once we have the parts of speech, it's really important that we actually understand how different words relate to one another. So this is what we, this is what we call syntactic dependencies. And this helps extract structure and understand grammar in a sentence. Then another thing we probably want to do is break sentences into noun chunks. So let's say I have a sentence, I went to Vienna to meet some really awesome JavaScript friends. The noun chunks in here are I, Vienna, and some really awesome JavaScript friends. And we'll see in later slides why noun chunks can be useful for analyzing meaning um, out of text. Another way to do syntactic analysis is to start extracting named entities. And named entities are basically any real world object, such as a person or a location or an organization. Um, in this example, I went to v Vienna to meet some really awesome JavaScript friends. Vienna is an entity, and so that's a geopolitical entity. JavaScript is another entity. It recognizes that as an organization. Finally, after doing all this morphological, syntactic, phonetic, and tokenization, we can finally get to semantics. And semantics means a way of representing meaning. Um, it abstracts away from the syntactic structure and tries to get at that, what the, ac what the actual sentence is saying. And obviously, def defining meaning and sem semantics is really, really hard. What is meaning anyway, right? Um, people have written many, many books about this. And if, I love this cartoon where there's a teacher that says, I have 12 tomatoes and take two, take two away. What's the difference? And the kid goes, exactly, I don't like tomatoes either. And then he, go, he gets into detention, and the, the principal's like, what are you in for this time? And he's like, semantics. Um, so it's very, very difficult to figure out what people are saying, because it requ it's, there's a lot of intricacies in language that we have to figure out. And so teaching a computer this is very, very hard. As an example, so we're used to structured data in programming, right? So let's say we have a table which has an organization name and location name. Getting data and information or meaning out of this is pretty simple. Like if we ask what companies operate in Atlanta, getting the answer to that is you just query, it's a simple SQL query of getting the location name which are Atlanta. But trying to do the same thing in a blob of natural language text is obviously a much, much more difficult problem. Um, how do we get a machine to understand enough about it to return the answers that we care about, right? Uh, it has no structure, and there's no links between the organizations and the location name. And so we have to take a much different approach to teach a computer to actually understand this. And the solution is to take that, somehow take that unstructured data, the unstructured text, and convert it into some kind of structure. 
And that's sort of why we did all the processing we did before. We took the raw text, we tokenized it, we did entity detection, we did chunking, we did part of speech tagging. And the whole goal of all that is to start to use that to do um, information extracting and find meaning in the sentence. So there's a lot of different ways, as I said, to define meaning. And I'm going to walk through a few different ways that we think about meaning when we're talking about natural language processing. Um, one is sentiment analysis. So if you can understand what kind of sentiment a piece of text has, then you can start to get some kind of meaning out of it. Uh, examples are like if you have a customer service uh, chat conversation, and if you can get the sentiment out of it, and if a customer is really angry, you know how to react to that. Um, and typically, there's a few different approaches to this. The traditional approach is just to count sentiment words. So for example, let's say you have a sentence, best movie of the year, a triumph. Best and triumph are pretty positive words. So it'll count the number of positive, count the number of negative, and then based on how, whichever is greater, the sentiment is that. But obviously, this becomes kind of, this doesn't work when you have something like not an abysmal failure, or fun, sweet, and earnest, but ultimately unsatisfying. Because even though, for example, the third fun, sweet, and earnest, but ultimately satisfying, even though it has three positive words and one negative word, we would classify it as positive, but it's actually a pretty negative sentence. And so what we do to some of the more advanced things that we do today are uh, use recursive, rec recursive neural networks to figure to understand sentiment. I unfortunately won't have time to go into how these work, but I want to show you a pretty cool example of this working. Um, this is Stanford's sentiment analysis parser. And I asked it, can you give me somewhat negative sentiments that contain the word scary? And one of the answers it spit out is um, an ill-conceived jumble that's not scary, not smart, and not engaging. So you'll see that even though there's two positive words and two negative words, it was able to detect that it was somewhat negative. Um, and that's how smart some of these sentiment analysis parsers are getting. Another way to understand meaning is to start classifying stuff. So classification is when we can take, uh, we can choose a correct class label for a given piece of input. And I'll hope, I hope to clarify what that means in the, in the next slide. So the goal is if you can classify a, an input to a label, then you can make predictions about new data of what that label for the new data will be. Um, and there's two ways to do it, supervised and unsupervised. So use cases. For example, if you can take an email and classify it as spam or not spam, that's incredibly useful, right? You can just move things to spam. Another use case is if you can classify uh, an article into its topics, so whether it's sports, health, fitness, running, um, that's another classification task. Or you can even classify words. So let's say you have the word bank. Bank can mean very, very different things in different contexts. It can mean a financial institution. It can mean a river bank. It can mean the act of depositing something into a financial institution. So being able to classify it into that is another classification task. And I'll talk about how we do it, how we quickly talk about how we do these classifications. So what we do is we do something called training. So we have a bunch of input data. And what we do is we take this input data and we, we, um, we determine what features are important for it to determine the right label for it. And we build a feature extractor that extracts that feature from that input. And so then taking all, taking all the input, we extract all the features, we create something called a feature set, which is information about all the input. Um, and then we feed it into something called an, a machine learning algorithm. And then when we have data that doesn't have labels, we can use the same feature extractor to extract the right features from the input, feed it into our classif classifier model, and we get a label. It looks very, very complicated, I'm sure, for if, people are first, if, this is, if, if this is your first time seeing it. But hopefully, walking through an example will clarify what I mean. So the steps are, I'm going to skip this slide, because I'll walk through each step. So we're going to take a task of classifying uh, a bunch of names into male or female. And so to determine that, to do that, we first want to decide what features uh, for the input are relevant. And then we want to decide how to encode those features. So I'm going to be super simple here. And I'm going to say, if the last letter of the given name, depending on the last letter of the given name, we can determine whether it's a male or female. Again, oversimplification, only one feature. But that's what we're, that's what we're going to use to encode our feature extractor. 
And so our feature extractor extracts the last letter of the name. Then we have a bunch of examples. And so what we do with those exa example names, and what we do is we take all those names and we either label it as male or female. And then once we've labeled those names, we can use our feature extractor that we built in step one to also uh, process a labeled name using the feature extractor. So what we'll, this will do is it'll, it'll, take the, it'll uh, extract the right features out of the, out of the labeled names and create the feature set. Then we can split this feature set into a training set and a test set. And then this is what we feed into our algorithm. Our alg now, algorithm now learns the input, the features, and the, and the right output. And so it's able to learn the relation between the input and the features and then the output. Then finally, we have a classifier, and we simply run it on our data, and we can see that it will classify our data into male or female. Another way, another way we can use classification is classifying dialogue acts. So if you're talking to Siri, for example, there's only so many ways that you can ask for help. You might say, help me, or you might say, I'm confused, or I'm lost. And so you can start to build a, a model that, where, you, where, you teach, where you train it on certain um, user utterances that are similar or have certain words, and it's able to classify future user utterances as that. And so that's what a lot of these chatbots do today. They classify certain dialogue types um, as either like a help dialogue type or um, order flowers dialogue type or um, whatever it is, or a customer service dialogue type. And it'll, it does that by doing classification, usually. Another way to do semantic analysis is to extract relations. So remember how before we had a bunch of named entities that we extracted out of the text? So the reason, we can, the reason that becomes useful is because we, we can start to find relations between the different entities in a sentence. Um, I'll show you an example. So let's say we have, uh, we know, we have, a, we, have a, we have a knowledge graph which already knows some relations. So it knows in this example that Bill Gates and Microsoft, the relation be between those two is founder. Um, Larry Page and Google, the relation between those two is founder. Um, Bill Gates and Harvard, the relation between that is college attended. And the way we were able to attain this in our knowledge graph is because we looked at a bunch of web documents that had text containing this information. And typically, the way it was contained was that it had the two entities and it had some piece of string in between. So in this example, in, Bill, in the Bill Gates example here, it had Bill Gates founded Microsoft in 1975. So that can become our feature, essentially. It's X founded Y. So the two entities are X and Y. Similarly, Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, so X, founder of Y. Um, you can go through and do the same thing for all the different labels and features. Then similarly, you feed it into this algorithm, and you run it on a test data, and now it's able to predict future relations. So even though you didn't give it the label that, it's, that Henry Ford and Ford Motor Co. are, the relationship between that is a founder, it's able to classify that as a founder relationship. So these are some of the ways we extract meaning out of text. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges. Well, the two biggest ones are ambiguity and context, lack of context, basically. So take the, take the sentence, I made her duck. There's five ways to actually interpret this. You can say, I cooked waterfowl for her benefit to eat. Um, I cooked waterfowl belonging to her, meaning I cooked her duck. Uh, I cooked the plaster duck she owns. I caused her to quickly lower her head or body, like some kind of, I, I made her duck. Or I waved my magic, magic wand and turned her into an undifferentiated waterfowl. So how do you determine what this means, right? Like this can mean all of these things. The reason it's so ambiguous is because, for, for one, duck can be a noun or a verb. Um, duck can also, her can also be possessive or dative. Then there's also make can mean create or it can mean cook. And then lastly, make can be, it can be transitive, it can be ditransitive, and it can be 
action transitive. So these are all the syntactic ways and morphological ways that we can analyze these four simple words. And so the possibilities become endless at this point. And not only that, but phonetically, it also becomes in incredibly amb ambiguous. You can say, I mate or duck, I'm ate or duck, I made her duck, I mate her duck, I made her duck, I'm ate her duck, I mate her duck, I ate her duck, I'm ate or duck. So you get the point. It's very, very ambiguous uh, from that simple sentence. So the way we solve ambiguity is typically we want to look for context in a sentence. We want to look for things around it and how it relates to other parts of the sentence. And so we look for things like morphological clues. So if, if you have an adjective like happy or, uh, and you add a ness, then it typically means it's a noun. Similarly, you look for syn syntactic clues. And I'll explain this in the, in the next slide. So context. So remember how we did parts of speech tagging earlier? So let's say we have the word duck. Does that mean the ver verb duck? Does that mean the noun duck? Does that mean her duck or duck for her? And the way we figure that out, again, is by context. And this is called n-gram tagging. So instead of just looking at the single word and, and tagging it that way, what we do instead is we start to look at words to the right and left of it. And we, we can determine the window of words you want to look at. But by looking at the words to the right and left of it, we can, we can more smartly determine the part of speech for that and then determine the meaning of the sentence. Another way is by looking at words around it, um, looking at features of words around it. So another example is taking the word bass. Bass actually has like eight different definitions. It can mean the lowest part of a musical range. It can mean the fish bass. It can mean an, an adult main, male singer with a really low voice and so forth. And so what we, another way to do it is we look for features about specific words in positions near the target word. So if you have the word bass, we might pick a window of two and look for certain features about those words. So maybe we're looking for the, the word player to exist if you want it to be one type of bass or whatnot. Another way is very similar, except instead of we look at the same window of words, but we don't care about the position. We just care about what words exist around it. So in this example, let's say we pick 12 words that are possible around the word bass. Um, and then we see what words happen in a window of plus or minus two. And in this case, we have guitar happens one and player happens once. And based on that, we start to infer meaning of like which bass they meant. So in summary, we've seen how word structure, word frequency, word similarity, they all happen to correlate with particular aspects of meaning. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're breaking down the structure of sentences. And it's basically pattern recognition using statistical models. And it's very rule-based, and it's pretty much a pipe process. And it's really our human interpretation, what we um, tell the algorithm, what we determine it means, that gives these models any meaning at all. And so the limitations are things like overfitting. So you saw how we were able to train the data on certain features. Well, what if we train it on too many features? Then the, then the algorithm might learn those features really, really well, but perform really badly on, on real un, unlabeled data. Another problem with this is you can't provide feedback across the pipeline. So if you tag a part of speech wrong and you use that part of speech to determine a noun chunk, then you're screwed if the first part of the, first part of the process is incorrect to start with. And most importantly, these things can't perform common sense reasoning. They can't really gener uh, draw on world knowledge in a general way. And, the pro and language, as you can see, is very much intertwined with human cognitive abilities. And so the computer, by doing all this pattern recognition, isn't really doing that. But there's a bright future ahead. Um, and I'll talk about a few of the things that make this space really interesting. Uh, we, saw how we, saw, we saw how we can do supervised training. And so there's another thing called unsupervised training, where it, with supervised training, we had to determine what features would pr produce the right label. With unsupervised training, what happens is we basically feed it a bunch of data, and it figures out the corresponding uh, features that are, that are relevant for that model. And the reason this is really, really powerful is because we don't have to sit there. A human doesn't have to sit there and create the feature extractor themselves. And so you can start to uh, train these algorithms much faster on large sets of data. Another really interesting 
another really big um, innovation in the space is use of neural nets for natural language processing. Neural nets basically are algorithms that operate like your brain. I won't go into this because that's a whole course on its own. But the, the beauty of these, some of these algorithms is that you just give it some data and it figures out how it can use the data to come up with the right features and models to accurately represent that data. So a human might not be good at figuring out the features, but the computer will figure it out. Um, the only problem with these kinds of methods where the computer figures out the features is that it doesn't have the intuition that you have of whether that's the right feature or not. And so sometimes the, uh, the algorithm will produce the output you want, and sometimes it won't. And you really have no control over it. And that's why they call these black box models. Um, there's not much you can do if it, if, because you don't, you don't even know why it classified it as a certain thing. And so really where I see a lot of the, the, lot of the, a lot of the work that will go into this space happening is in the training. So we, the existing algorithms work just fine. Supervised machine learning is just fine. I think it's just a matter of creating, creating a much better way of annotating this data and not making it much easier to do that. And, and, and reusing human knowledge in a much more easier way to, to label this data and kind of move this industry forward. So I think a lot of people in, in AI, there's a lot of hype about all these algorithms and how, how neural nets are gonna change the world. And I think that's, the hype in, hype in AI is that algorithms are the future, but I think the hype should be that the data and the training is where all the, all the, all the or a lot of the effort should be going today. And so conclusion, We've come a long way in how we understand natural language. We've got a long way to go, uh, but we have a bright and exciting future ahead.